So I want to talk about uh, refactor your knowledge portfolio. Well, let's talk about knowledge portfolio. We are, I'm going to say we are what we code in. Well, pro Pragmatic Programmers, the book Pragmatic Programmers, uh, advised us that we should learn one new language every single year. What they really meant was we should learn one very different language every single year. Uh, if you know Java and you're learning C-sharp, that doesn't count. It's got to be something that makes you cry, something that hurts you, something when you're done, you say it was worth it. And, and to me, learning is like peeling an onion. Uh, those of us who peel onions know what I'm talking about. What happens when you peel an onion? You cry. That, that's exactly right. And onions also have layers. And that's one of the things I've learned in my life is learning is full of layers. There are times I would learn something, and how naive of me, I would think that I understood it. Only a few days or a few months later realize I had no clue what I was talking about. And then there's a layer to peel. And when you peel that layer, there are more layers to peel. And this is one of the things that excites me. Um, I'm an old guy. I've been programming for a good 35 years. And I still wake up every morning and I start coding. And the reason I program is that every single day that I program, I feel like a kid in a candy store. And, and, and that is one of the things that excites me to be a programmer. And I would think that I was not born a programmer, but I can tell you I'll die a programmer. Because I just love the learning aspect of what's involved in programming. I'm going to say that when I started programming, this was a long time ago, what really drew me in was the math and the science and the engineering in programming. But what really kept me as a programmer is the art in programming. The language that I program in completely molded and structured my thought in a certain way that any other thought, any other way of thinking was very alien to me and I had to reject it. And then that's when I realized that this is not going to make me a better programmer by limiting myself to know one thing. And, and I started really putting effort towards it. I have to say it was not easy. It was really hard journey, but today I program in about 15 different languages. And, and the reason I program in 15 different languages really is that every single language reminds me that there is no one way to do things. There are so many different ways to do things, and not all of them are right, not all of them are wrong, they're just different. And we have to really pick and choose what may make sense based on the context of what we are really trying to do. And from that point of view, I want to uh, use this particular quote, I think is really a wonderful quote. I want to stay as close to the edge as I, uh, as I can without going over. Uh, out on the edge, you can see all kinds of things you cannot see from the center. And this is so true if you really think about it. Um, I'm a big fan of mountain hiking. There are two things I do in my life. Programming is one, mountain hiking is the other. And honestly, I'll be very uh, honest about it, I'm actually very fearful of heights. And when I go up on the rocks, I have to stop and I have to calm myself down because I look down and I'm all shivery. And yet, I really like to go climb up mountains. And because, you know, hands tight, you're holding into the rock, you look over, and that's just absolutely amazing, the view you get from the top. And this is exactly the reason why I like to program in languages that are so weird and so different. Because when you push yourselves away from the mainstream to the edges, there are things you can see that most people who are living in the mainstream can never experience. And that's one of the reasons why I like to really go to the edge and look at languages that are new, languages that are different to learn from them. But if you really think about it, programming is a very nascent field. We've been programming for maybe about 50, 60 years, much more significantly in the past about 40 years and more so in the past few decades. But if you look at a lot of other human activities, programming is very nascent compared to that, and we have been just learning. And, and, and when people ask me, what will be the future? What particular technology, what language will be really the most um, significant? This is like asking the world what would be the technology we used 
about, you know, 3,000 or 4,000 years ago, or even before that. And we are just in the beginning. And if people ask me, what will be the future? My answer usually, I hope it's not what we know as of it right now. It's got to change a lot. We're just still making mistakes, and we need to learn from that as we go along. But let's talk about something else for a minute. Suppose I want to buy a car. What car would you ask me to buy? Now, of course, you may think, why is he talking about cars all of a sudden when we are talking about programming languages? I'll, I'll draw an analogy to this in a few minutes. So I want to buy a car. What kind of car should I buy? Oh, I can read minds. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Venkat, you should buy that one. All right. Well, what I mean by that is you're telling me I should buy an electric car. Electric car is the rage, isn't it? Everyone wants to buy electric cars. What will happen if we all buy electric cars? Everyone in the world buys electric cars. What's going to happen if we all buy electric cars moving forward? Well, the whole of the United States will be sprinkled with electric change stations. That was a quote from 1899. No, 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 I didn't make a mistake. It is a quote from 1899. Because many people don't know this. Electric cars were enormously popular back in 1900. And this is what the world was. Back in 1900, there was no cars that drank gasoline like they do today. So one of the one third of the automobile industry back in 1900 were powered by electric. And it turned out that when the cars were mostly electric, they really had trouble keeping those electricity running. They would run out of batteries, kind of who guessed. And eventually they found out they could power through gasoline, and that started giving a lot better performance. And as a result, the world went on to gasoline-powered cars. And of course, we know the rest of the history, how that process was streamlined, and we slowly forgot about electric cars. And then we have a new generation which never really looked at it, and now we are like absolutely excited about electric cars. If there was somebody who was 115 years old, they wake up and look at it like, why are you guys excited about this? This is exactly what we talked about when I was a child, they would be thinking, isn't it? And it turns out that if you look at the automobile industry, the very first few cars were steam-powered and electric-powered. Then came along gasoline-powered cars, and then eventually we are back again getting excited about electric cars. And our programming field is exactly going through that cycle as well. Our field is very similar in that the very first few programming languages we introduced is not what we get excited about today, if you think about it. Functional programming is the electric cars of the programming world. So when we started programming, the languages were functional style and structured. Object-oriented programming didn't even exist at that point. Object-oriented programming is the gasoline-powered cars of our industry. And we really came up with that about 15, 20 years after functional programming was introduced. And then, of course, that became the mainstream, just like gasoline-powered cars. And everybody started using it. And then all of a sudden, we are excited about functional programming. If somebody has been around in the field for 60, 70 years, they wake up scratching their head, hey, this is what we talked about when I was a kid. Why are all these people suddenly excited and thinking it's new stuff? Well, what is old is new again. And that is the weird part of what we do. And, and we work in a field where we don't come up with new things. We just come up with new names for things and get really excited about it. So this has been around for a very long time, as it turns out. But let's talk about Java for a little bit. Java is special. Java is special in a lot of different ways. Java is one of those languages that has survived the longest period of times. If you look at language history in the past, languages lived for about 10 years. And that's the lifetime of a language. It'll come to prominence, if at all it could, 
it would be prominent for about seven to eight years, and then it kind of fades away. And almost all the languages did that. Ten years of prominence. People will still use it, like people still use COBOL, but that's not the mainstream, that's not what people are excited about. But Java is one of those few languages that really defied that logic. There are only two languages, I think, maybe if you could, we could claim, that did that. One is Java, and the other is the one that everyone loves, right? JavaScript. And so almost every other language fade away, but Java has sustained so long. But if you think about Java, what does Java have? One of the reasons for that is we have the JVM. And JVM is the most scalable, multi-threaded platform. It contains the gar our ability to do garbage collection. It is one of the most ubiquitous platforms ever. The JDK is absolutely powerful and versatile. I mentioned earlier, I, st I started programming in C++. One of the nice things about C++ is everyone who wrote program in C++ wrote their own collection. How do you feel about that if you think about it, right? That was pretty dumb. And when Java came out, it had a library. We were like, wow, we don't have to write our own collection. What a difference. What do we do now, right? And, and this is amazing that you had actually a very strong library to use. And then, of course, the Java language. And every book in Java said, Java is simple. But then, of course, as you start using it, you learn a few things. Java was not simple. It was simpler than C++. I call this the politics of programming languages. You know, if you notice the politics, I can definitely speak about my own politics, my own country. If you look at the US politics, what do they do? Every four years we do this. Somebody will come up and say, he or she sucks, elect me, and I will change your world. Four years later, somebody says the same thing about this person, right? And we are so happy to keep voting every four years. And, and you know, Einstein said, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. We collectively are insane, that's what we are saying. But the point really is that Java, when it came out, it said, oh, it's simple, but what they really meant was it's simpler than C++. But if you really think about this, you can say that the JVM is absolutely ubiquitous. You can say that the JDK is the most widely used and absolutely powerful. And I would argue Java is the weakest link of all the three. And Java, the language, has been the weakest link uh, for a long time. Now, clearly, you may say, hey, look at what Java has done in the past about five years to maybe six years, and yo, absolutely, I would agree with you. Java has changed more in the last five years than in the past 20 years. And I'm going to argue, honestly, I say this with good faith, Java is going to be changing the most in the next five years than in the past 20 years, because Java is rapidly evolving, and there's a reason for it. And the reason is, it's a place where a lot of change is absolutely needed if Java needs to continue to live in the future. Because the Java as a language is a weakest link unless it changes quite significantly moving into the future. But, but the designers of Java today are very aware of this. If you really think about what happened in history, right about the time 2000, I would say there was an exodus. People started programming in Ruby and Rails and other languages. This is the time in 2003 when you had languages, uh, a, a renaissance, so to say, where we started having languages like Groovy and Scala and JRuby and Clojure. A lot of these languages came to surface in about 2003 timeframe. This was a perfect storm. And I have to uh, I tell you that I have the deepest respect for every one of these languages, and I'll tell you why in a few minutes. And, and these languages to me, are the reason why Java is what it is today, and Java will be what it is in the future. And I'll give a name for these languages in just a few minutes. So given these languages and how things are shaping up, Java still continues moving forward, no doubt about it, but these languages play a very vital role. So if you look at the environment we are in today, we still have the JVM, we still have the JDK, both of which have evolved, certainly, but the language landscape is very different. You have Java, Scala, Groovy, JRuby, Clojure, and of course, Kotlin. And a lot of these languages are pretty exciting. But if you really think about these languages, I look at languages as vehicles. Uh, if you think about it, 
you probably took a bicycle to ride around. You probably took a car to go around. I took an airplane to come here, and then I took a taxi to come here as well. So on a given day, we use multiple modes of transportation. I look at languages as vehicles. There are times when I want a bicycle, there are times when a car is a better choice, and I need to be able to switch between them. That's what makes me effective to go around. Similarly, as a programmer, I find myself more effective when I can switch between these vehicles to get around than being forced to use one single language to move forward. So from that point of view, what is old is new again, and we see this quite a bit in our history. Well, it's not the syntax that really matters. Oftentimes, when I work with new languages, when I talk to programmers who use languages, I cannot tell you how many times people tell me, oh, I hate that syntax, or I love that syntax, which is really missing the point because syntax is the least exciting for me. And, and honestly, I can never learn the syntax by reading a book or reading a language. Syntax becomes natural to me as I code, I complain, I cuss, and eventually I don't even think about it. And syntax just becomes natural for me over time. What is the most important thing in a language is the semantics and how you can use that language. That matters a lot. But when you learn a language, we all go through certain troubles. Here's a beautiful picture from the seven habits of highly effective people. And I want you to think, look at this for a second. How many of you see a very old lady in this picture? Uh, okay, you see how many people saw that. How many of you see a beautiful young lady in the picture? A few of us. How many of you see both? Uh, okay, you need, you need help. Okay, but the point really is, you see both after you kind of look at it and say, maybe the first time you saw it, you didn't see both. And maybe you saw this very old lady who is absolutely generous and, and ready to feed you when you're hungry. Or maybe you saw this gorgeous young lady over there, but it's the same picture. To me, programming languages are exactly that. When I look at a language, I see that old lady or the young lady, and then after working with the language, I see both aspects of it. And, and this is really the perception we have. There is no wrong, there is no right. There's nothing about, oh, you should have seen this versus that. We both are right. It doesn't matter which one you saw, or you're seeing both of those. But the point really is, when we look at this, languages are not about syntax. Languages are all about idioms. For example, a phrase in English, uh, it rains cats and dogs. It makes zero sense, isn't it? Because if you look up the dictionary, you can look at the word rain, and you can look at the word cat, and you can look at the word dog, and you wonder why would it ever rain cats and dogs. But this is the beauty of idioms. Idioms are interesting because idioms don't mean what they mean if you put the meanings of words in the dictionary, which means you cannot learn the idioms by learning the dictionary. You need to know idioms have a connotation. Idioms have a history, idioms have a story, and idioms have a usage. Programming languages have idioms. So when you learn a language, if you're learning a syntax, that's like learning the dictionary. And you end up speaking, but you never will be comfortable like the person who is native to that particular language. But once you mingle in a society, what do you do? You hear people say absolutely silly things. And then you say, why would it rain cats and dogs? And then they tell you the story of what that means. And after a few months, maybe you use the phrase yourself. Learning a programming language is like that. You learn the idioms of the language, and that takes a little bit of time and effort to learn those idioms. But idioms are very important. If you don't know how people native do it, you're in for a very big surprise. Like Coca-Cola learned the very hard way. Coke wanted to do marketing in the Middle East. And they wanted to promote Coke uh, for the people in the Middle East. And so they came up with this absolutely phenomenal marketing idea. They put out this be beautiful poster. And the poster showed a person absolutely tired, completely dehydrated, fall on the uh, flat on the ground. And that person drinks Coke. And after drinking Coke, the person is energized and starts running. And they put this out, and the sale just dropped. Nobody wants to buy Coke anymore. 
And they were like, wow, why don't people buy Coke anymore? What happened? And that's when somebody told them, the people in the Middle East read from right to left. <laughs> so this person who was jogging drinks Coke in almost dead. Like, why would you buy it? This is one of the reasons why context matters. We really need to understand how it feels to be in that particular environment. Because if we don't, we aren't going to be for a really big surprise. Now, of course, we all make mistakes like this every single day. The only difference, I always say this, I make mistakes, but the only difference is when I make mistakes, I'm not on the news, right? That's the only the saving grace for me. When these people make mistakes, everybody talks about it. So the point really is we do have to understand the connotations and the idioms and the and the local information is very important to know how things really behave. But we are poised for a very interesting evolution in our field, and this has been happening for a while, for a good 60 years, but over the past few years, things have become really more exciting. And that is the imperative style of programming versus the functional style of programming. And, and here's a beautiful quote by Stuart Holloway. Uh, Stuart uh, is a, a works in a Cognitech, he's the CTO of Cognitech a company behind Clojure that Richie uh, created. And uh, he says, good code is the opposite. I if you Google for it, you'll find it. I highly recommend reading this blog post, beautiful blog post. Just Google for essence versus ceremony. And he talks about good code is the opposite of legacy code. It captures and communicates the essence while omitting ceremony irrelevant details. Capturing and communicating essence is hard, he goes on to say. This is so true. And the word I like the most often is essence versus ceremony. So what is ceremony? Ceremony is what you have to do before you get to do what you really want to do. Anyone here who loves ceremony? No, because ceremony sucks the life out of you. You are like, wow, this is great, I'm gonna do this. And they're like, oh, hold on, please. You have to do all this ceremony before you go to do that. And you're like, what fun is that? Essence removes the ceremony so you can focus on what you want to do. Let's think about this for a minute if you think about essence versus ceremony. Let's talk about ceremony for a minute. Now, let's think about this for a minute. How many of you have ever had a chance, even informally, to teach Java to somebody? Maybe a friend, maybe a colleague. Come on, is that all? More of us did. Come on, you always try to teach Java to somebody, whether they like it or not, right? And you always did. You're sitting in a train and somebody says, what do you do for a living? I'm a programmer. Really? Let me show you, right? You always do this. We are such a people. We always love showing off our code. So you told this person, I pro, uh, you know, and they come to you and say, is Java really hard to learn? And you say, oh, Java is easy. It's the simplest language on earth. And the person says, well, I'm new to programming. Oh, don't worry, Java is easy. You can learn it in your sleep. Really, can you teach me Java? Of course, let's sit down, I will teach you. What's the first thing you did? You said public. Excuse me, what is public? Um, you don't need to know that right now. The person is no noting down public, no need to know that right now. Then you said class. Excuse me, what's a class? You don't need to know that right now. Okay, hello world. And the person is like so happy. Yes. And then you put a curly. They're like, huh? What does that mean? Then you said public. And the person immediately looks up the book and says, I don't need to know that right now. Then you said static. And they're like, excuse me, is that also something I don't need to know right now? What is that called? Ceremony, isn't it? By the time, they don't even know what's still coming, right? And you keep on going, and they are like sitting and saying, did you say Java is simple? And this is, you know, as programmers who are doing this every single day, it doesn't bother us. But it's not about you and me. We have 10 million people using Java. Not everybody is the same. We got new people coming into the field, and they are shopping. And when they go shopping, they look at one where you can do the following. What can you do? You can simply come in here and say, print line, hello world, and you can run it like that. Or 
they are still working here. And that person who is shopping says, hmm, which one do I want to start programming in? Ceremony or just the essence, where I can get my work done and I can actually go home and do other fun things. Maybe including coding at home, right? That's what we do. But the point really is, ceremony really makes it hard for us. Or even, even worse, let's go a little further with this. It doesn't have to stop right there, unfortunately. It can become even more difficult. For example, all I want to do is thread.sleep1000. Now, what does Java say? Java says, not so fast. Uh, sorry, what am I supposed to do? You better handle the exception. So what are you going to do now? Try. And then, of course, you put the catch block right here. And then you say exception, EX. And now you have no clue what to do with that. How many of you have spent sleepless nights thinking, night thinking, what do I do with the exception that sleep throws me? Right? And what does Java say? Java says, you write the code in all simplicity. You say, hey, I want to just call sleep. Java says, you will handle the exception. What does the programmer say? The programmer says, let me show you who is in power here, and puts an empty catch block. <laughs> there is no way to win this battle, isn't it? Because when you try to outsmart the programmers, the programmers always outsmart you. So this is why we see all this empty catch block in the code, and we don't have a clue what to do. Or if you tell your developers, no more empty catch blocks for you. The next week you're doing code review, you see this beautiful print stack trace everywhere. Like this is somehow better, isn't it? Now, this is again an example of when you force programmers to do things, it becomes really hard. But what if languages say, you know what, it doesn't really matter. If you want to handle the exception, do, otherwise don't. So I can put a little thousand and I can say there, I can run the code, I don't need to be handling exceptions I don't care about. So the point really is, we can remove a lot of that ceremony. Now, to be fair though, Java has improved substantially over time. But the reason I want to talk about it is, we really always have to challenge ourselves. We always have to find better ways to do because we are working in a big field where we need to be producing results, not dealing with ceremony. Let's talk about reading from a file. Now, I grew up in this environment. You know, Java was simpler than C++, so I didn't complain a whole lot because it was a lot better than what was available. But what I want, what I want to do is the following. I'm going to say import java.io.star. Then I want to say buffered reader. A reader is equal to new buffered reader. And then I say new file reader. And then what am I going to say over here? I'm going to specify sample.java, which is the file I want to uh, read over here. So I've created this buffered reader. And what do I want to do? If I try to run the code, Java again says, you need to handle the exception. But when you get experience with Java, you find ways to deal with it. As experienced programmer, you say, fine. And you put throws exception and say, you shut up now. And the Java compiler is like, OK, fine, you win. So what do I do now? I'm going to say while. Well, first of all, string stir is equal to null. What is null? Null, we all know what it is. Null is a smell, right? We don't get proud using null. Uh, in fact, the person who invented null is the person who invented so many other wonderful things in our, in our world, uh, Tony Hoare. He actually apologized for creating null. And, and so in this case, of course, I'm going to say while, and then I'm going to say stir is equal to reader.read line. And then what do you do? Is not equal to null. How do you feel when you write that code? Absolutely dirty, isn't it? And you're looking at this like, gosh, did I really do that? And then you're going to output the string you just read to display the file we just wrote the code. That is absolute ceremony, right? But why should we do all that work? Can't life be really simpler? Well, thankfully, I mentioned that Java learned a lot from other languages. So import java.nio.file.star. Now I can write over here, files.lines. This is still Java, isn't it? I can say paths.get. 
and I can ask for the sample.java, and I can say dot for each system dot out dot print line, and I can ask it to print the content of the file without as much ceremony. Now, which one would you write? Would you write the top code, or would you write the bottom code? I'll tell you what I would write. If I'm a consultant paid by the number of lines of code I write, I'll write the top one. I can get more money. But if I want to get my work done, I would favor really a sentence versus ceremony. But again, you can see this works. But why can't I just use file? Why shouldn't I simply use file? Like java.io.file, the good old file. And I'm going to say sample.kts dot for each line. And I can take every single line and print it. So when the code begins to read like the problem, and we don't have to involve ceremony, this is code in Kotlin, where I've written a Kotlin script, and I'm just reading the file, and what did Kotlin do? Kotlin said, hey, JDK is awesome, but it has a few missing parts to it, and they have done extension functions to it, so the file now has a function that can read the lines and return to you, thanks to the for each line added by the Kotlin standard library. So we can move, push boundaries towards it. But the point I'm really making here is that we can make a big difference by using sensible things in the languages. Like, for example, think about this, these two things. Where if you're used to languages like C Sharp and Java and C++, like I came from, I want you to think of two words for a minute. I'm going to say the word statement. How do you feel when you hear the word statement? A little grim. I don't see anyone smiling in the room. Let me try this. Let's say the word expression. Did you just see that? You started smiling already. When I say expression, it's like it lifted some burden off your shoulder, isn't it? Statement is so governing, so strict. And when you use a statement, that's how you feel. <sighs> expression. And expressions are awesome. What is wrong with the statement? What's wrong with the statement is, what does the statement return to you? Nothing. How rude, isn't it? A statement says, I finished the work you asked me to do. Really? What is the result? I won't tell you. I put it over there, go get it for yourself. So by definition, what do statements do? They force mutability on us. By definition, statements force mutability. Expression returned result to us. If you look at a purely functional language, there are no statements. This was mind blown for me because I woke up one morning and said, whoa, you could actually have a programming language with no statements in it. And I couldn't believe it. How could you have a language where there are no statements at all? Is that even possible when everything is an expression? Let's think about this with a little example here, if you will. I'm going to write a class called foo. And I'm going to create an object of foo. So I'm going to put a foo.new. This is just one example of uh, a Ruby code. But I wrote a class called foo. What's a class in Java? Oh, it's a statement. If somebody tells you, assign the class to something, you're like going to look at them and say, do you know Java? Right? You can assign stuff like that. But why not? Why not say puts right on that? What is it going to put? The return, the result from the class, if you will. So why can't classes be expressions? And this suddenly changes the view of the world, isn't it? For example, if I say age is equal to uh, 12, I can say what equals to if age greater than 17, what do I want to do? I could say vote and as an expression. Or I could say else, uh, you know, go home, kid. And I can write code where the if is no longer a statement. What if if is not a statement? What if if will become an expression? And then I can start writing code with expressions. I don't need to mutate stuff when I can have expressions. And this, why, why is this exciting for me? Because the minute I learned 
that you could actually program with expressions, I started writing my code very differently in Java. I started writing more expressions for myself in my APIs than writing statements. Because statements cause mutation, expressions don't force mutability, which means I can write more pure functions, and it can become a lot easier for me to work with functional style of programming as well. Learning these ideas changes the way we start programming the languages we work in. And, and so that's one difference, huge difference. Every language leaves its mark on the world. And if you really think about it, the language that I programmed in the most, C++, what is C++? Gaon Stolstrup created C++, and he created this as a better C. How do you define C++? I'm going to say this is what C++ is to me. It's a beautiful language. I love the language, honestly. But it's an amazingly fast language, but incredibly dangerous. This is a language that will allow you to shoot yourselves in the foot. Now, I'll tell you how you can recognize C++ programmers. If you're sitting next to one, you will know this. You will look at them, and you will see them absolutely excited in the morning. And you look at them and say, you seem excited. And they're like, yes, I want to go, go to work now. And I want to see what my code is doing, because they have no clue what it's going to do. And the language is that capable, but you can shoot heels in the foot. And they'll come to you and say, I never thought you could do that. And they will spend 30 hours fixing the bug now. And I've done this for my life. This is very powerful, very dangerous as well. What about Java? Java, of course, changed the world. Java introduced a lot of ideas that were there, but it really streamlined it. Automatic garbage collection, for example. Really powerful JVM. A lot of those ideas were there before, but the virtual machine idea, automatic garbage collection, was really brought to mainstream by Java. And Java made a big difference in that regard. But I want to define a word here, and I mean this, I call these bridge languages. I call them bridge languages for a good reason. The reason I call a bridge language is Java today is evolving at a rate you never imagined. But if you go talk to the designers of Java and ask them what they are adding into Java, I want to make this very, emphasize this very clearly. Java is not interested in doing everything that every language does. What Java is trying to do is Java says, is this useful? Is this feasible? And is it something we can do effectively within Java? But Java is not going to be the language that innovates these language features. Java cannot do that. Part of the reason for that is the user base is too large for Java. Java doesn't have the luxury of doing things and saying, oops, that didn't work out really well. Let's remove it. But you know what? I love languages like Groovy and JRuby and Scala and a lot of languages. Why? Because those languages, they will try ideas. And if it doesn't, doesn't work out, they will remove them. But these languages are the playing fields for a lot of innovation on the JVM. I call these bridge languages for a really good reason. And the reason these languages to me are the JRuby, Scala, Kotlin, Groovy, and Clojure, these are the bridge languages. They are bridge languages because these languages are bridging the ideas, the language innovations to the JVM. So once they try it out, they draw the bridge and see if the bridge actually stands. And if it falls down, well, don't go that route. We need to retry this. But once these languages have experimented, we as Java programmers can come and start using the benefits. If you look at the features coming in Java in the next five years, every single one of those features is in one of those languages at least. And this is one of the reasons I have the deepest respect for these languages. Because these language designers have gone forward and tried these ideas, experimented, implemented, for us to look at that and say, hey, that seems like a great idea. We can use that too. And the, and the world can benefit from these ideas. So they share a common trait. They are very concise. They are highly expressive. And more, all of them in that list are, have functional style. And, and, and a lot of this has been learned already. We are using functional style and lambdas in Java today, introduced in 2014. I started using that early 2000s in Groovy, for example. So you could, this is an idea. In Scala, it's been around since 2003, for example. 
So they also promote immutability, pure functions, functions with no side effect, higher order functions, and so on. All of these ideas we are already benefiting in Java. So Java did a phenomenal job in implementing these. Don't get me wrong. I love Java for one reason. Java did a phenomenal job of implementing lambdas. Java did not innovate lambdas, but it implemented lambdas in the most effective way on the JVM, and, and hats off to that. So in the functional style of programming, we are avoiding the mutable state. So what we are doing is a state transformation rather than state mutation. If you look at the bottom picture, that resembles reactive programming quite a bit as well because we are moving towards a reactive pipeline of computations. And this idea of a functional pipeline is so prevalent now. We are beginning to use this in almost every single application we are developing, and languages are becoming really better at doing this as well, including Java, moving us in this direction. So these languages that I talked about are definitely game changers. And part of the reason I spend time learning these languages is it really makes me rethink about how I program in the language I program in. And it, it substantially changes the way I approach these languages as well. So when it comes to lang learning languages, people often ask me, what language do you pick to learn? I want to pick a language that will change my thinking. I don't want to learn a language that, that teaches me what I already know. I want to pick a language that I will scream, I will kick, I will complain while I'm learning it. And when I'm done with it, I come back saying, wow, that was a very interesting journey, and I learned something I never knew was possible. And, and then, over a few years later, I see these very ideas that I once programmed in another language becomes part of the language I program in. And that reduces the learning curve for me, but I'm also able to use it very effectively. And, and that is one of the reasons why I see these languages as the game changers. So what can we do as companies and as individuals? And this is one of the things that absolutely excites me because we work in a field where we have the power in our hands. We are working with computers, and our entire world is right up here. And, and to me, this is the most exciting part because if you look at almost every other aspect of life, there is something tangible. And when you do something in the world, you can cause damage doing it. You, some of the damage could be irrevocable. But for us, we can sit on our computer and we can change our thinking and change it again and change it again and try new ideas and come out thinking very differently. But we can learn a great deal from other people who have been before us in the world we live in. So first is, as a corporation, what can we do? We have to evaluate risk, and we have to evaluate the reward as well. And I, I emphasize this because I travel around the world, and consistently I hear people come to me and say, my company doesn't want to invest into this new language, or they don't want me to even try using these language, even for testing purposes, or for prototyping. And to me, that's a big disservice because if I want to be a leader in the industry, I got to rethink about what I do as a company. Just to give an example of this, here's something to think about. This is a map of the a part of Wyoming and part of Utah and part of Colorado. And here is Cheyenne. Uh, Cheyenne is the windiest part of the United States. Uh, and the wind is just unbelievable in this area. And there's the Rocky Mountains. And then to the west of the Rocky Mountains is Salt Lake City. And as the crow flies, it's a 370 miles, or if you take the road, it's 400 and, uh, 440 miles. And this is going around the mountains, as you can see. If you are in the business to transport things between these two points, that's a lot of journey. Especially in the winter, it can be really hard because there could be a lot of snow in these areas. This is exactly the point of about 100 years ago, give or take, maybe about 80 years ago. But there was a guy, and his name now is the name of the Denver's uh, main terminal. His name is Jepson. And Jepson started flying flights from Cheyenne to Salt Lake City. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. 
This is when there was no airlines. He was one of the pioneers in the field. And he started flying. Now you can imagine how hard it is to fly through the mountains. You could crash, and people did. And people lost their lives crashing. So what Jepson did, when he started flying, just for his own purpose, he started drawing a chart of what is out there. And he started keeping a chart. So every time he would fly, he would write down notes on the chart. And other pilots came to him. They were having a little chat. And they found out that he was writing notes. And they looked at it and said, what is that? Oh, this is just a chart I started creating as I'm flying. And they said, can I have it? And he said, sure, for 10 bucks. He started selling the chart to other people. And guess what? Those other people bought his chart. And as they started flying, they were using the chart. And they found the chart was not complete. They started taking notes on the chart. And when they come back to him, they would give him their notes and say, here, go integrate it, and then sell it back to us again. And this guy was working for the airline, and he was the very first person to start creating charts. And his eventually became transformed into world standards in the, in the field. Eventually, the airline that he worked for became United Airlines through generations of it. And you can imagine, here we are sitting in the comfort of our computer. We are writing code. The worst thing that can happen to us is a segment fault. Whereas there, they are up there flying, and people could lose their lives, and yet that's what he did. And he created an entire new industry that we thrive on the world economy today. It's just amazing to think about it. Those draw inspiration for me, because if they can do such really hard things, pff, I can do what I do, because it's absolutely insanely simple what I do. And the other thing to think about is, is to create the forages of how the bees work. And this is something we can learn from these creatures. Bees go out to look for honey. And when they do, they all kind of disperse and go away until a group finds really good honey, and they do what's called a bee dance. And then, of course, that's a way to tell every other bee in their community that they found a really good stash of honey for that day. Companies can learn a great deal from this. As an organization, imagine they can send us to explore, and we can come and do the dancing. I love to see the dancing one day where we can say, I found this language, it's awesome. And the rest of us can go towards that direction and start exploring in that particular language. This is a great way to innovate as a company, as an organization. As an individual, what can I do? And I, I'll say this honestly. Um, there's a beautiful quote by, um, gosh, I'm throwing a blank at the moment. Um, so there's a beautiful quote where the quote simply says, I stood in the shoulders of the giants, Newton. So that's such a beautiful quote. We all know how absolutely phenomenal he was. And yet he said, what I learned, I learned from standing in the shoulders of the giant. And I'll tell you, I'm not the smartest person on earth, but I am thirsty to learn from other people. Every opportunity I get, where I can pair with somebody else and look at what they do and how they think is a way for me to learn and rethink what I do. And this is one of the things I would say as individual we should definitely avoid doing is isolation. We can learn so much and help other people learn so much by interacting with them. And what I would definitely think about is this. Uh, as the beautiful quote here says, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. I cannot emphasize that unlearning. And I, like I mentioned, I've been programming for 35 years. What I enjoy the most is the unlearning. Because to, for me to wake up one morning and say, everything I know is different, and I can relearn and rethink about what I do, is really powerful in my opinion. Because it makes me humble to know that 
I'm not done yet. I have so much to learn and to unlearn and to relearn. And that to me is absolutely phenomenal. It gives me the strength to continue every single day in this field. And, and to be able to really do it, how can we do this? I'll tell you how not to do this. Because you sometimes see these programmers, they don't look like this, but they pretend like this, where they would be sitting and coding like that. This is not the way to do it. What we can do in our work is to create an environment where we will be really excited about learning from each other. This kind of goes to the uh, uh, Pavlov's theory about, cla about classic conditioning. The environment we create can change our behavior. If you ask me, what is the best job I've ever had working in a company? The best companies are companies where the team made it absolutely safe for me to be honest, for me to say, I don't know, for me to say, I want to learn, and for them to sit with me and teach what they know and learn a little what, what I know from me. That collaborative environment is the most important thing. You know the saying, right? Tell me who your friends are, I'll tell you who you are. That applies so much to programming as well. To create that culture where we will go out and experiment and learn and innovate, that corporate culture is absolutely important. And if we can find companies and create environments like that for ourselves, I think we're going to be great because environment shapes behavior. We definitely should avoid it, but go towards more collaborative environment. So our strength is together where we can learn from each other and we want to build that community and be able to continuously learn from each other. As JFK said, there are risks and costs to a program of action. There's absolutely that's true, but they are far less than long-range risk and cost of comfortable inaction. I would argue a lot of what corporations do predominantly is that comfortable inaction. But there is a risk to trying new ideas. There is always risk, but the cost is less compared to the alternative, and I hope we all will go out, go out to innovate and, and we will explore that. I, like, I, like I started with saying, uh, it is absolutely a phenomenal field to work in. And, and the reason I enjoy that is the learning and the relearning and the unlearning and relearning. And I think we can do a great deal. And looking at these languages, the, uh, the bridge languages as I call them, is great because we can experiment with them. We can help those languages go explore because we contribute by using them too. And those languages in turn learn from what works and what doesn't work. And in the end, when those languages are done with their experimentation, other languages are able to pick up and the world benefits because of our uh, you know, uh, desire to help with those languages. Let's go rock the world. It's a lot of fun place to be. Thank you. <laughs>